Excuse me. If everyone would please take their places. We're starting a bit behind schedule, so uh, we want to waste no further time. Good afternoon. I'm Professor William Wagner, the director of Catholic University's Center for Law, Philosophy, and Culture. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today to a public exchange of views on the topic of the Obama administration and the sanctity of human life. Is there a common ground on life issues? What is the right response by pro-life citizens? Today's event features presentations and discussions by two leading scholars and political commentators, both Roman Catholics and both members of the pro-life community, presenting two different perspectives on the current administration's policies regarding such issues as abortion and embryonic stem cell research and their impact on societal attitudes regarding respect for human life. The purpose of the event is to advance understanding within the pro-life intellectual community in the United States of the issues of what potential for common ground exists with the Obama administration on life issues and what, in any event, is the right response of the pro-life community to the new administration. The coverage in the press of issues relating to President Obama's recent appearance at Notre Dame University indicates that discourse within the Catholic and pro-life communities on this question is of general interest to members of the American public. We are very pleased that members of our audience today represent not just the pro-life community, but other communities of discourse within the United States as well. These members of our audience are most cordially welcome. We hope that the exchange of views we will hear today uh, will be of value not just to members of the pro-life community, but to all members of the American public, regardless of their view on these issues. You will note that today's event is billed as a discussion and not a debate, for it is not a debate. It is intended to present for the audience's consideration a fuller presentation of views on both sides of the question to be compared and considered within the largest possible lens. The tenor of our event is much in accord with the challenge posed by the nation's president while he was at Notre Dame. I quote him. The question then is how do we work through these conflicts? Is it possible for us to join hands in common effort as citizens of a vibrant and varied democracy, how do we engage in vigorous debate? How does each of us remain firm in our principles and fight for what we consider right without demonizing those with just as strongly held convictions on the other side? The Catholic University's Center for Law, Philosophy, and Culture, the sponsor of today's event, exists to promote inquiry into the role of law in relation to culture and culture's orientation to the human good, the scope of its inquiry is both theoretical and practical. In its theoretical aspect, the center aims to contribute to the academic fields of jurisprudence and the philosophy of law, as well as to Christian political and social ethics. In the practical dimension, it seeks to foster renewal and transformation of culture under contemporary circumstances through law and law reform. In the president's remarks just mentioned, he concluded by calling for open hearts, open minds, fair-minded words. This is good. In the present setting, under the sponsorship of our center, we would want, however, to clarify and make explicit what the president certainly left, uh, meant to leave as implicit. What do we leave our hearts and minds open to, in particular? So as we to convene this discussion today, let us leave our minds open to the truth and our hearts open to love for one another in the light of our creator's love for all of us. I will now shortly turn the floor over to our able moderator, the Honorable Marianne Glendon, learned hand professor of law at Harvard Law School and former United States ambassador to the Holy See. Before I do, allow me to say just a word about our format. Professor Glendon will speak for several minutes, not just to introduce our speakers, but further to introduce our topic. Then she will keep time as each speaker presents in turn. Each speaker will come to the podium to give a 20-minute presentation of his basic viewpoint. Thereafter, with the moderator and this, uh, uh, Professor George will do the same, Professor Glendon as moderator and the two speakers will, will then sit before us and Professor Glendon will pose a question to the speaker. She will then also read questions from the audience for the speakers to consider in turn. Monitors are prepared to pass out note cards to the audience. You're invited to write down questions as they occur to you and pass them to the outside of your uh, aisles to be uh, assembled to be given to Professor Glendon. And then each speaker will have uh, 
brief time for a closing comment. Professor Glendon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wagner, and thank all of you for coming to this evening's discussion, which has been intentionally billed, as you have heard, as a discussion rather than a debate about life issues. It will be a discussion, moreover, between people who have much in common. Both have devoted much of their professional careers to the study of American government and constitutional law. Professor Robert George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and the director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. And Professor Douglas Kmick is Professor of Constitutional Law and holder of the Caruso Family Chair in Constitutional Law at Pepperdine University School of Law. Both of our speakers are pro-life. Both are Catholic. Both accept the characterization of abortion by the Second Vatican Council as an unspeakable crime. Both are lawyers who have severely criticized the existing state of American law with respect to abortion. And both believe that citizens in a democracy, when they disagree about public policies with grave moral implications, that they should present their reasons for their views and respond to opposing arguments in a civil and respectful manner. It's precisely because they share so many important premises that professors George and Kmick have agreed that this evening's exchange, which will include a discussion of their differences, will have three principal aims. First, to promote informed opinion within the pro-life community about the current administration's stance toward respect for human life. Second, to reflect on the proper responses of pro-life citizens to current governmental policies affecting life issues. And third, to explore whether there is common ground on the life issues. And toward those ends, the speakers have also agreed to confine their remarks to the broad areas covered by the following questions. They're very broad indeed. How do you believe the moral purposes and limits of government policy relating to the life issues should be defined? At what point and why, in your view, do such considerations become of overriding concern? What actions or policies of the current administration do you believe have advanced those purposes or respected those limits, if any? What actions or policies of the current administration, if any, have undercut those purposes or crossed those limits, in your view? What considerations, if any, would, in your view, justify some compromise? And if some compromise is acceptable, at what point would you regard it as becoming unacceptable and why? Finally, what considerations do you deem relevant to determining the extent to which a pro-life citizen ought to grant or withhold cooperation to the current administration? Our first speaker, as determined by a coin toss, is Professor Kmick. Professor Kmick has 20 minutes to make his opening statement. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be back at the Catholic University of America, once removed to the National Press Club. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be in discussion with the Honorable Marianne Glendon and with my colleague and friend, Professor Robert George. I come to this topic in part to reflect upon a journey that I've been on. Uh, some suggest that it's a curious journey uh, but it is a journey that was motivated in large part by the quality of our president to actually seek common ground. One of his finest features, beyond his intellect, beyond his capability to articulate great thoughts and to inspire, beyond his ability to even transcend the racial divisions in our country by merit, with scarcely a mention of his skin color, 
is the fact that he set out from the earliest moment in his primary campaign to not win elective office by dividing, by stirring hate, by reigniting the culture war, but instead by finding, or at least exploring, in an honest intellectual way, whether common ground can exist. Now, the pursuit of common ground, as Ambassador Glendon alluded, must always in be compatible with truth. And of course, that is the great teaching of our faith, that a democracy not anchored on the truth of the human person has gone awry, as John Paul so well taught us in Veritatis Splendor. And nevertheless, the fact of the matter is, is that in this imperfect exile in which we find ourselves, we do rely upon the invention of man, the constitutional system of which Professor George and I teach, to resolve most disputed questions of truth. And where democracy and democratic choice do not lead to a consensus answer, we turn a limited number of those questions over to the judiciary, asking them to identify on a dispassionate basis the values and traditions implicit, as we say, in the concept of ordered liberty. So the goal here, as I see it this evening, is to explore the boundaries of both truth and the pursuit of common ground. Let me begin by saying what I find, as a Catholic, to be unacceptable in the pursuit of common ground. I would find it to be unacceptable to argue that abortion should be morally permissible. I would find it unacceptable as a Catholic to argue that attitudes toward abortion be merely considered as private matters, not influencing public policy. I would consider it unacceptable to argue that the conscience and religious practices of others that differ with us on these profound issues of the nature of the human person can be used in any way to excuse us from being true to the understanding of the faith as the church holds it out to us. And while I agree wholeheartedly as a, as a Catholic American citizen that majority will tempered by judicial review is the day-to-day -day operational mechanism by which we have agreed to live together as a people with many different ideas. That in itself can never excuse or deny or erase the ultimate truth. Now, of course, harmonizing these two propositions has been the subject of other thoughtful leaders most notably, again, John Paul in the Gospel of Life in Evangelium Vitae, number 73, where he wrote that when it is not possible to overturn or completely abrogate a pro-abortion law, an elected official, I emphasize the adjective, whose absolute personal opposition to procured abortion is well known to him may implicitly support proposals aimed at limiting the harm done by such a law and at lessening its negative consequence. Such compromise, such embrace of the reality of life does not, wrote John Paul, represent an illicit cooperation with an unjust law, but rather a legitimate and proper attempt to limit its evil aspects. Intent. Intent is a key element in so many things that we will be discussing today. Intent was a key element in the answering the question, can a Catholic support him? Gee, that would make a good book title. Because to answer the question, can a Catholic support Barack Obama for president, one has to 
think about intent both objectively as well as subjectively. Is it reasonable to believe that the good and the truth would be advanced by his election? And is that indeed our subjective intent as well for casting our vote in his direction? Now later in the discussion, I want to spend time discussing with Professor George and Ambassador Glendon the possible compromises in specific. But there's still more background that needs to be cleared. And the fundamental question, it seems to me, is given what I have just outlined in terms of essential commitments to the truth, are we as Catholics expected to sit on the sidelines aloof with our truth, talking to among ourselves, reinforcing our goodness, or are we to engage our fellow citizens and indeed offer that gift of the truth of the human person as faith and reason has given it to us in matters of election and matters of public policy. You already know the answer that I would give is the second. And the 2008 election was very much a test of that. Now, of course, it wasn't the first test of that proposition. In 1960, a Catholic running for president was asked by a group of Protestant ministers whether a Catholic could be an American. The answer President, or then Senator Kennedy, gave in the intensity of that scrutiny and time was an answer that makes some of us in this room today as we read those words quite uncomfortable because it was a separation that he prescribed of such great dimension that it seemed to forfeit one for the other. But the most essential point that the senator, then ultimately president, would make is that it was not appropriate for any faith tradition, including the Catholic tradition, to assume ab initio. I was a dean. You got to use a little Latin every now and then. To assume from the beginning that one's position would automatically be accepted, applauded, and enacted into law. Quite the contrary. We were to come and translate our faith tradition into understandable terms and offer it to our fellow citizens. Could a Catholic support Barack Obama in 2008? This Catholic believed the answer was unquestionably yes. Barack Obama was, of course, not of our faith, and yet he spoke consistently of attention in matters of life toward those who are the least advantaged, in matters of economy toward those who seek a just and family wage in a system of laws and taxes and policies that were not so well calculated to provide it. He sought to end a war that the leadership of our church pleaded with the former president not to enter. He sought to be a steward and seeks to be a steward, steward of the environment in ways that we have thoughtlessly not been as we have consumed so much of the world's resources when others are in starvation and when the climate is in jeopardy. As a matter of life, he seeks to reform the health care system. He seeks to welcome the stranger in terms of immigration. And yet, of course, there is the question of abortion. How to handle that question? I don't think the way to handle that question is with intimidation. The denial of communion is intimidation. Let me tell you 
that to be separated from the body of Christ, even once, is intimidation. But it's not just an isolated case of a mistaken priest on that occasion, who thankfully, with the discipline of the local archbishop, wrote a letter of apology, which of course is accepted. It is instead that throughout, since 2004, it has been the teaching of at least some bishops that this is something that should be readily advertised and pursued. Mr. Carey, don't come to St. Louis. Mr. Biden, if you're in town in Denver and you're attending mass, you should think twice about coming to the altar rail. Kathleen Sibelius, because we disagree with how you have discharged your responsibilities as you've been advised by your legal counsel, stay away, publicly confess. I suggest that is not either an effective nor a Catholic approach. Nor is it a Catholic approach, as the bishop's own document indicates, for the church to endorse candidates, and yet particular bishops explicitly endorsed candidates. Nor is it the approach of the church to allow materials in its vestibule that basically proclaim it to be a sin of the highest order to cast a vote for the Democratic candidate, Barack Obama. The bishops, I think, have it right. Catholic voters can have proportionate reasons to approve of a candidate who is not pro-life. So long as the Catholic does not have an active intent to advance the intrinsic evil of abortion or to vote for a candidate for the purpose of advancing that intrinsic evil, it is not morally illicit for a Catholic to cast a ballot in that fashion. Now, all of this was, it seems to me, well understood by the American public and the Catholics who voted, 54% of them voting for the incumbent president. Now, some would dismiss that as saying those are the ones who come only once a year, that we greet at Easter time, in truth, the Pew Research Foundation has found that the balloting was in fact made up far more significantly of traditional, regular worshipers. But this issue, even after having been decided in the election, of course, returned again at Notre Dame. Father Jenkins, pursuing the image of the university so well articulated by Father Ted Hesburgh, the crossroads in the lighthouse as President Obama made reference to it in his own remarks, the place where Catholics come to do their thinking when they're not watching Notre Dame score another touchdown. Well, they may be thinking even then. Father Jenkins, it seems to me, illustrated brilliantly what it means to be a Catholic institution of integrity, engaged with the public discussion, openly and respectfully disagreeing with the President of the United States on his policies on abortion and stem cell research, and nevertheless strongly applauding his efforts to address poverty, fairness of the economic system, the care of the environment, the unjust war, and so forth and pointing out something that in our assuredness of our own correctness, that it wasn't just the invitation that was controversial or difficult, it was also the acceptance. That the effort at common ground is not just our effort of extending a hand, but the difficulty of a president of the United States doing it as well. And what did he say? 
He said what he has consistently said in the campaign and later, namely that he would pursue economic and social improvements to address those most vulnerable, most likely to choose an abortion, women in poverty, women facing life without shelter, without food, often without a spouse, almost entirely without insurance, that his purpose in providing that additional assistance would be to reduce what he calls and what all of us in this room would call a moral tragedy, that he would indeed observe a sensible conscience clause, and we should talk about the details of that in the questioning, that he would recognize competing moral claims in the context of embryonic stem cell research. And Marianne, I'm counting on you to signal me when, when it's my time to be quiet. And I, on the topic of stem cell research, he has already illustrated in the NIH draft regulations that he's listening. Now, listening doesn't mean 100% agreement with us, but it means significant funding for adult stem cell research that had not been previously indicated. It means concentrating not on reproductive cloning, which he put out of bounds in his original announcement. It doesn't mean even creating cells for purposes of research. It means, of course, dealing with those that are created in the context of IVF or in vitro fertilization treatment. In all of this, I suggest that Barack Obama has indeed been working and the church has been working with him more recently toward common ground. What are the lessons of the election and the most recent time period? One lesson has to be that the church is not a political party and it can never find itself captured by either political party. It is not the Republicans, it is not the Democrats. It transcends in its purpose all of those earthly considerations it indeed, as Tocqueville reminded us, should not trade the greater for the trivial. It should not align with the popular because at the moment that that popularity ceases, then of course the insight of faith can by association be dimmed for people as well. It also teaches, it seems to me, that if we are to be shepherds, if we are to act toward each other in the way in which Jesus taught us on the Sermon on the Mount, that we are not to use mechanisms of intimidation, whether they be in pamphlets or on blogs or in the hand over the ciborium, that turns us away from the love of Christ. And in doing that, we must be careful to observe the proposition that it is wrong to make the perfect the enemy of the good. It is wrong to make justice the enemy of love. And quite frankly, it is wrong not to recognize the good heart and the possibilities for genuine respect for life in someone coming from a point of view that is not necessarily the one that we ourselves have indulged in the past. Thank you. I'll now call Professor Robert George up to the podium Professor George, you have 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Ambassador Glendon. 
Let me also express my gratitude to William Wagner and the Center for Law, Philosophy, and Culture at the Catholic University of America, and my special thanks to Professor Kamick for agreeing to this public exchange of views. One does not treat an interlocutor with respect if one refuses to speak plainly. Candor, far from being the enemy of civility, is one of its preconditions. And so I will this afternoon speak candidly on the points where I, as someone dedicated to the principle that every member of the human family possesses profound, inherent, and equal dignity, find myself at odds, deeply at odds, with President Obama and his administration. In my judgment, citizens who honor and seek to protect the lives of vulnerable unborn children must oppose the Obama administration's agenda on the taking of unborn human life. Our goal must be to frustrate at every turn the administration's efforts, which will be ongoing and determined, to expand the abortion license and the authorization and public funding of human embryo research uh, and abortion. Because the President came into office with large majorities in both houses of Congress, our task will be a daunting one. But the difficulty of the challenge in no way diminishes our moral responsibility to meet it. And I here call upon pro-life Americans, including those who, like Professor Kamick, supported President Obama and helped to bring him to power, to find common ground with us in this great struggle for human equality, human dignity, and human rights. Professor Kamick and I share common ground in the belief that every member of the human family, irrespective of race or class or ethnicity, and also irrespective of age or size or stage of development or condition of dependency, is entitled to our care and respect and to the equal protection of our laws. This is what it means to be pro-life. In this shared conviction, Professor Kamick and I are on one side of a crucial divide, and President Obama is on the other. Professor Kamick and I stand together in our opposition to abortion and human embryo destructive research, but alas, we share very little common ground on these matters with President Obama and those whom he has appointed to high office who will determine the fate of vast numbers of our weakest and most vulnerable brothers and sisters. I appreciated the President's candor at Notre Dame, especially when he said, and I quote, now understand, understand class of 2009, I do not suggest that the debate surrounding abortion can or should go away, because no matter how much we may want to fudge it, the fact is that at some level, the views of the two camps are irreconcilable, unquote. The president is right. His view regarding the status, dignity, and rights of the child in the womb, and the views shared by Professor Kamick and myself, are irreconcilable. A chasm separates those of us who believe that every living human being possesses profound, inherent, and equal dignity, and those who, for whatever reasons, deny it. The issue really cannot be fudged as people sometimes try to do by imagining that there is a dispute about whether it really is a human being who is dismembered in a dilation and curatage abortion, or whose skin is burned off in a saline abortion, or the base of whose skull is pierced and whose brains are sucked out in a dilation and extraction or partial birth abortion. That issue has long been settled, and it was settled not by religion or philosophy, but by the sciences, the modern sciences of human embryology and developmental biology. So it is clear that what divides us as a nation and what divides Barack Obama on one side from Robert George and Douglas Kamick on the other is not whether the being whose life is taken in abortion and in embryo destructive research is a living individual of the human species, a human being. It is whether all human beings, or only some, possess fundamental dignity and a right to life. Pro Professor Kamick and I affirm, and the President denies, that every human being, even the youngest, the smallest, the weakest, and most vulnerable, those at the very dawn of their lives, has a life which should be respected and protected by law. 
the president holds, and we deny, that those in the embryonic or fetal stages of human development may rightly and freely be killed because they are unwanted or potentially burdensome to others, or because materials obtained by dissecting them may be useful in biomedical research. The president speaks of human rights, and I do not question his sincerity. But he does not understand the concept of human rights, as Professor Kamik and I do, to refer to rights above all the right to life that all human beings possess simply by virtue of our humanity. For the president, being human is not enough to qualify someone as the bearer of a right to life. Pres Professor Kamik and I, by contrast, believe that every member of the human family, simply by virtue of his or her humanity, is truly created equal. We reject the idea that it is at the foundation of President Obama's position on abortion and human embryo destructive research, namely, that those of us who are equal in worth and dignity are equal by virtue of some attribute other than our common humanity, some attribute that unborn children have not yet acquired, justifying others in treating them despite their humanity, as non-persons, as objects or property, even as disposable materials for use in biomedical research. President Obama knows that an unborn baby is human. He knows that the blood shed by the abortionist's knife is human blood. The bones that are broken are human bones. He does not deny that the baby whom nurse Jill Stanek discovered gasping for breath in a soiled linen bin after a failed attempt to end her life by abortion in Christ's Hospital in Chicago was a human baby. Even in opposing the Illinois Born Alive Infants Protection Act, which was designed to assure that such babies were rescued if possible or at least given comfort care while they died, Barack Obama did not deny the humanity of the child. What he denied and continues to deny is the fundamental equality of that child, equality with those of us who are safely born and accepted into the human community. During his campaign for the presidency, then Senator Obama was asked by Rick Warren, when does a baby acquire human rights? In reply, the future president did not say, well, it depends on when a baby or a fetus comes to life or becomes a human being. He knows that an unborn baby is alive and human. He did not pretend not to know. His response to Pastor Warren did seem to express doubt uh, as to when rights begin, saying that that question was, as you'll recall, above his pay grade. But Obama's record as an activist, legislator, and now as president makes clear his view that an unborn baby, or even a baby outside the womb like the one discovered in that soiled linen bin by Jill Stanek, possesses no rights that others are bound to respect or that the law should in any way honor. Throughout his political career, Obama has consistently and fervently rejected every form of legislation that would provide unborn babies or children who survive abortions with meaningful protection against being killed. Indeed, he has opposed even efforts short of prohibiting abortion that would discourage the practice, limit its availability, or directly favor childbirth over abortion. Professor Kamik and I believe in the equal fundamental rights of all, including the equality of mother and child. We recognize that women with undesired pregnancies, especially poor women, can undergo serious hardships. And we believe that a just and caring society will concern itself with the well-being of mothers as well as children. We agree with Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who by precept and example taught us to reach out in love and care for mother and child alike, never supposing that love for one entails abandoning care and concern for the other. President Obama holds a different view. He has made clear his own conviction that the equality of women depends on denying the equality and rights of the children they carry. He has made what is, from the pro-life vantage point, the tragic error of supposing that the equality of one class of human beings can and must be purchased by denial of the equality of another. 
one wishes that President Obama had listened carefully with an open mind and an open heart to the pleas of Mother Teresa during her last visit to the United States. Her message then was that a pregnant woman, woman in need is not in need of what she called the violence of abortion. What she and her child need are love and care, love and care from all of us. Our task, Mother reminded us, as individuals and as a society, is to love and care for mother and child alike. President Obama's supporters do him no good service by pretending that his expressions of willingness to find common ground with pro-lifers involve at some level recognition that abortion or embryo destructive research is bad or tragic because it kills a living member of the human family. Unlike, say, former President Clinton or former New York Governor Cuomo or even Vice President Biden, President Obama does not profess to be personally opposed to abortion or to believe that abortion is a wrongful act that must nevertheless be legally permitted because the consequences of outlawing it would be worse than those of tolerating it. His belief in his policy is that abortion, if a woman chooses it, is not wrong. That is why he is not personally opposed. There is no wrong there to oppose, no injustice. Indeed, the president made crystal clear his view that abortion can be an entirely legitimate and even desirable option when he said that if one of his daughters made a mistake and became pregnant, he would not want her to be, and I quote him, punished with a baby, unquote. In such a case, he saw abortion as the right solution to a problem, ensuring that a woman wasn't punished with a baby, a solution that we should be happy is available where it is available and that we should make available if it happens not yet to be available. Without it, a young woman would be, as he said, punished. Now, I have no doubt that the president regards it as deeply unfortunate, sometimes even tragic, that the problem giving rise to the woman's need for an abortion exists. But there is equally no room to doubt that President Obama regards it as fortunate that a solution to the problem in the form of abortion is available. For someone holding this view, and many people in the academic world hold it, it's a familiar view, abortion is not in itself a bad or wrongful thing something to be opposed in itself, personally opposed, any more than a knee replacement operation is in itself a bad or wrongful thing. Of course, it would be better if no one ever injured a knee and found himself in need of a knee operation. No one regards knee operations as desirable for their own sakes. No one deliberately injures himself so that he can have a knee operation. And people don't have knee operations performed on them for frivolous reasons. But a knee operation is not something that one would discourage or be personally opposed to. It is a solution, a solution to a problem and should therefore be made available and accessible as much as possible to people who need them. For those who share President Obama's view of the moral status of the child in the womb, the decision to abort may be more wrenching for many women. The president used that term at Notre Dame, a wrenching decision, more wrenching certainly than the decision to have a knee operation typically is. But it's like a knee operation precisely in as much as it is a solution a legitimate solution to a problem. All of this was made transparently clear at a recent meeting at the White House in which people on both sides of the abortion issue were brought together to see if they could find some common ground. The meeting was led by Melody Barnes, the director of the President's Domestic Policy Council and a former board member of Emily's List, one of the nation's most aggressive organizations devoted to legal abortion and its public funding. At one point in the meeting, she recognized pro-life activist Wendy Wright, who attempted to explain ways that the president could begin to achieve his reported goal of reducing the number of abortions. According to Wright, Melody Barnes interrupted her to make clear that the precise goal of the administration is to reduce the need for abortions. Two days after the meeting, the president spoke at Notre Dame and he chose his words carefully. In speaking of common ground, he did not propose that we reduce the number of abortions, but rather, and I quote, the number of women seeking abortions. Get it? The president and his administration will not join us on the common ground of discouraging women from having abortions or even in encouraging them to choose childbirth over abortion. The proposed common ground is the reduction of unwanted pregnancies, 
not discouraging those in, quote, need, unquote, of abortion from having them. The idea that the interests of a child who might be vulnerable to the violence of abortion should be taken into account, even in discouraging women from resorting to abortion or encouraging alternatives to abortion, is simply off the table. The president and the people he has placed in charge of this issue, such as Melody Barnes, have a deep ideological commitment to the idea that there is nothing actually wrong, unjust, about abortion because the child in the womb, in truth, as they see it, actually has no right not to be killed. The commitment explains the policy positions President Obama has consistently taken since he entered the Illinois legislature. It crucially shapes and profoundly limits what he and those associated with him regard as common ground on which he is willing to work with pro-lifers. And it explains why he and they reject what we as pro-lifers propose as common ground. Because the president does not believe in the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of every member of the human family, because he does not believe that babies acquire human rights until after birth, because he does not see abortion as tragic because it takes the life of an innocent human being, he is utterly and intransigently unwilling to support even efforts short of prohibiting abortion that would plainly reduce the number of abortions. Moreover, he is adamantly in favor of funding abortions and abortion providers at home and abroad and has already taken steps in that direction by revoking the Mexico City policy and proposing a budget that would restore publicly funded abortions in Washington, D.C., despite the well-documented and universally acknowledged fact that when you provide public funding for abortion, you get more abortions. Some pro-choice people think that the killing of unborn children where there is no grave threat to the mother, though bad and unjust, should not be made illegal, at least in the earliest stages. Potentially, we would have significant common ground with these fellow citizens in the form of policies to discourage abortion and reduce the number of killings. For example, we could join together to oppose the funding of abortion at home and abroad. We could work together for bans on second and third trimester abortions, on abortions for sex selection, and on particularly heinous methods of abortion, such as partial birth abortions. We could agree on what Professor Hadley Arcus calls the most modest first step of all, namely requiring care, at least comfort care, for the child who survives an attempted abortion and is born alive. We could provide desperately needed financial support for pro-life clinics and assist pregnant women in need, need that is not always financial but is often emotional and spiritual, and encourage and help those women make the choice for life. We could enact waiting periods, informed consent laws, and parental notification laws that have been shown in research by Michael New and others to reduce abortions. We could reject the funding of embryo-destructive research and join together to support promising research and treatments using non-embryonic sources of stem cells. However, far from meeting us on any of these areas of common ground, the President opposes our efforts. Political realities have prevented him from making good on his promise to the abortion industry to sign the pro-abortion nuclear bomb called the Freedom of Choice Act as one of his first acts in office, but he was not lying when he made that promise. His policies and, above all, his appointments to key offices in the White House, the Justice Department, Health and Human Services, and elsewhere make clear that his strategy will be to enact the focus uh, provisions step by step rather than as a package. As anyone occupying the role of David Axelrod or Karl Rove will tell you, this is obviously a politically astute way for the President to prosecute his agenda. The country does not accept President Obama's extreme position on abortion. A recent poll showed that a majority of Americans now regard themselves as pro-life, and a majority favors significant legal restrictions on abortion. Plainly, the President's actual views are far more favorable to abortion than those of the general public. So if he is to advance his goals and the goals of those who share his commitment to making abortion more widely available and easily accessible, the last thing it would make sense to do is try to invoke, uh, to uh, uh, push through FOCA as a package. The common ground I am interested in with pro-life Americans is with pro-life Americans like Professor Kamik, who have supported the president politically. The election is over and the current question is not who anyone thinks will do the best job as president or even whether one may legitimately support candidates who deny the fundamental dignity and right to life of unborn human beings and who promise to protect and extend the abortion license and expand funding of embryo destructive research. The question is, on which issues will we support president, the president's direction, and on which will we challenge him because he is heading in the wrong direction? Those pro-life Americans who voted for him and support him should not object when we speak out 
for the most vulnerable and defenseless of our fellow human beings, even when that means severely criticizing the President's policies. They should stand with us on common ground and join their voices with ours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor George and Professor Kmeg. We now enter the question and answer phase of our discussion, and uh, the moderator has been given the privilege of asking the first question to each of you. So, Doug, uh, here's my question. Given that nearly everyone in the national discussion agrees that it would be desirable to reduce the number of abortions, and given that the great majority of states have now passed uh, parental involvement laws, uh, informed consent laws, uh, giving pregnant women information about the stage of development of their unborn child, about the help and assistance that's available to them. Given that uh, this state legislation is thought to be at least in part responsible for the 25% reduction in abort abortions that we've had since 1992, how would you justify the administration's claim that it will help to decrease or that abortions will decrease if they are publicly funded and if FOCA repeals those state laws that uh, actually facilitate choice by giving pregnant women more information about the procedure, the risks, and the help that is available. You have three minutes. <laughs> FOCA is a a piece of legislation I've been testifying against. In fact, I think you and I testified against it uh, in the 1980s. We testified against the partial birth abortion, uh, in favor of the partial birth abortion ban. Right. Uh, I've also testified against the Freedom of Choice Act and its original iteration. The one thing about the Freedom of Choice Act, it's been floating around Congress for, what is it, about 20 years now, and uh, the uh, the, the, the political reality is that it has no constituency. Indeed, when the president was asked about it at a recent news conference, he said, yes, uh, in, the, in the heat of the primary, I talked to my Democratic uh, Planned Parenthood constituency, but I have now admittedly moved that off my legislative agenda. Um, now, that's a political calculus. That's his political calculus, and it's not mine because, of, of course, I've made it clear uh, as I need to for Evangelium Vitae number 73 to be applicable that my position is unequivocally opposed to it and I would continue to argue with him uh, to be opposed to it as well and I think that's had some effect. Um, I want on the remaining part of the question and to engage Professor George's thoughtful presentation Science, you indicate, supports us. Um, the problem is, is that many people, including most scientists, don't say that. What most scientists say is that all of the essentials for human life in that first cell, that first fertilized cell, are, of course, a human being. They will not say and this is what our opponents always say to us, as you well know, they will not say that that results in a legal conclusion of personhood. Now, we read the science differently. We read the natural law differently. We read the, te the consistent teaching of the church differently. But we are also in this American plurality, this... Uh, place of many religions and many beliefs and no beliefs, and we have an obligation to contend with this, with this view. And so I guess my response is, is that the president also has an obligation to respond to that view, also has an obligation to respond to those both as a matter of faith and as a matter of science do not see the truth of the human person in the way we do. Now, 
Professor snuck in an extra question there, and you're only going to have three minutes, but you have to answer my question first. <laughs> and that is uh, in the conversations that are taking place around the country on these issues. It seems to me that uh, the discussion uh, among pro-life Catholics is less about abortion itself, as you both have agreed, but rather about the relative weight of various life and social justice issues. So my question to you, Robbie, is how would you answer the pro-life Catholic who says, I'm pro-life, but I am going to vote for the pro-choice candidate whose views agree with me on capital punishment, on relief of poverty, and on just war. When we vote, we should vote with primarily justice and the common good in mind. We shouldn't just vote self-interest or what's in the interest of my class or group. And above all, our vote should be determined by our commitment to human rights and by our sense of where the greatest violations of human rights are taking place. That means we need to look at the scope and the magnitude of the injustice as well as the injustice itself. And when we look out and we see more than one million tiny defenseless human beings being destroyed by surgical abortion alone in a year, laying aside even the issue of embryo destructive research, and we try to stack that up against other legitimate concerns. Poverty is a very important concern. The environment is an, impor is an important concern. Uh, making sure that we don't go to war when we shouldn't go to war, when unjustified in going to war is a grave concern. But when we look at the scope and magnitude of the evil of denying an entire class of human beings the protection of the laws with the result of more than a million of them slain in a year, that has to be given priority. Even Joseph Cardinal Bernardine, the great hero of the consistent ethic of life who said we must treat abortion in the context of war and militarism and exploitation and poverty, said that he thought that those on the left, as he said, were misusing the consistent ethic to authorize voting for pro-abortion candidates. He said he didn't see how anybody could vote for a pro-abortion candidate who understood the scope and magnitude of the evil. If I can sneak in an answer to Doug's question I that he put to me, <laughs> I would simply ask Doug, uh, in my role as a member of the President's Council on Bioethics, I've had the occasion to look at all of the leading textbooks used in human embryology. I don't know if you have, but if you have, do you know a single book that denies or fails to affirm that the child from conception forward is a living member of the species Homo sapiens, a human individual at the beginning of his life who by directing his or her own integral organic functioning will develop himself through the stages from the embryonic into the fetal, into the infant, child, and adolescent, into adulthood with his unity and determinateness and identity in intact. We may disagree. I don't think you'll be able to come up with a book because there isn't one. Uh, but the dispute with scientists is not about science. A scientist might have any opinion on the value question of when a human being has rights or when a human being has value. Okay. But as to whether you have a human being, that's not a I, matter of scientific I'm taxing dispute. you both with two questions and two <laughs> answers here. Now I'm uh, turning to the questions that have been submitted by members of the audience. And uh, I will alternate between you. Uh, please take not more than a minute or two for your answers. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, we will never get to all of these. <laughs> all right, Professor Kmick, you say it is intimidation for the church to separate an abortion supporter from the body of Christ. What right do you as a Catholic have to call the acts of bishops who follow canon law intimidation? And do not unrepentant abortion supporters separate themselves from the body of Christ? Yes, I think the, uh, but the premise of the question is abortion supporters and abortion advocates. And uh, I think that begs the question. Uh, those of us who saw Barack Obama as, a, as an alternative saw him saying, basically, Roe versus Wade and the effort to overturn Roe versus Wade, or at least in terms of my calculus in coming to his side, the effort to overturn Roe versus Wade was going nowhere. 
And even if Roe versus Wade was overturned, it would do nothing other than move the choice from the mother to the states. And so the Catholics who endorsed him, who did the proportionate reasoning, not only weighed the war and the environment and poverty and the need to address all of human life, which our faith calls upon us to do, but also address the fact that the alternative of protecting life had not shown to be particularly effective and that Barack Obama was articulating a way of protecting human life that was, or that seemed to us to have more hope. That's a different proposition, and the proposition that Canon Law 915 authorizes bishops to, to, to judge that to be advocacy of abortion, I simply think is wrongheaded. Okay. This uh, question from the audience follows along with what Professor Kmeck has said. Uh, Professor George, why can't a Catholic view voting for Obama instrumentally, that is, forget about common ground, if there are, in fact, fewer women seeking abortions and fewer babies are killed, what's wrong with that? Note that not all the causes of the hypothetical reduction need be objectionable to Catholics. Indeed, uh, for example, not contraception, but reduction of poverty. Well, here's the problem. Uh, if President Obama were interested in reducing the number of abortions, as I, and as I say, he, he and his administration members are careful not to say that. They say, stressing, eliminating the need or the perceived need for abortion, then some things he is proposing to do he wouldn't do. He would not subsidize abortion with public money. The abortion industry itself tells us that that's likely to raise the number of abortions by 300,000 a year. They lament that 300,000 women a year are not getting abortions who, quote, need them because there's not public funding. He would restore public funding. He would not oppose informed consent laws, parental involvement laws, uh, waiting periods, and other laws that, as Michael News research has shown, reduce the number of abortions. It just seems to me implausible that you would reduce the want to reduce the number of abortions and then subsidize it and oppose any legislation that would actually reduce the numbers. On the uh, communion issue, and I didn't get into religion, and I don't think it's especially central to uh, the, the, the debate, which is really one about science and justice, but I'm puzzled about one thing. Uh, in the 1950s, when Joseph Rummel, the Archbishop of New Orleans, excommunicated three major politicians in his state for their opposition to uh, desegregation, for their advocacy of racial injustice, the New York Times and other liberal uh, newspapers and, uh, and folks praised him for that act. It was a prophetic act, they said. Now, when John Kerry, is told by a bishop in St. Louis that because of his advocacy of abortion, he cannot uh, receive communion, they take the position that no bishop should ever deny someone communion. Would, I, I wish the New York Times would tell me which it is. So um, that actually was one of the questions that <laughs> <laughs> just was taken care of there <laughs> to Professor Kmick. Can you name one legislative or executive action not more rhetoric in which President Obama has directly contributed to the defense of unborn human life? Well, I think that the creation of the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships with the director being given explicit instructions to make the reduction in the need for abortion uh, his highest priority and uh, presumably that means the vast sums of money that have been passed for everything here in Washington while the rest of us in California are going bankrupt along with GM, that those vast sums of money will in part be allocated to local organizations that have, many of them faith-based organizations, that will have the capacity to do some of the things that Professor George outlined local initiatives capable of, of being done. But he, he very clearly said within a few weeks of his uh, inauguration that that was the highest priority for that office, and I believe him. Second, when, per, when Cardinal George came to meet with him on St. Patrick's Day, uh, I encouraged his eminence to raise the stem cell issue with the president. 
And I, I wasn't in the meeting, so I don't know exactly what was said. But I know shortly thereafter, the NIH draft regulations came out, and suddenly there was a very different orientation. Now again, Professor George, I know, was still find that orientation to be significantly short, but it was an orientation toward funding adult stem cells. It was an orientation toward not giving federal monies to create embryonic stem cell research. It was an orientation that in, in, included a consent requirement that seems to me to be sensitive to this issue. Now, those are all uh, efforts, it seems to me, toward moving toward uh, protecting life. And you can't overlook the rest of his agenda, the fact that he's uh, creating households that can economically support their families is also undeniably a way to protect life because the, there is an absolute correlation between the success and failure of the economy and the number of abortions in this country. The number of abortions went way up during uh, the first President Bush's administration uh, because of some economic uh, difficulty, which pales in comparison to what we're experiencing now. And it went down significantly during the Clinton administration, again, because of economic prosperity. Here's a question for Professor George. Would you be able to engage with the Obama administration if it agreed that rights begin when a human person is generally, underlined generally, agreed to be present at a point later than conception? Well. I'm willing to engage with the Obama administration in any discussion of the rights and dignity of the child in the womb, because this is where President Obama and his administration have gone fundamentally wrong in recognizing no rights for the child at any point in uh, gestation and fetal uh, development. Now, my own view is we need to protect the child at all stages from the very beginning. I believe in the inherent and equal dignity of all human beings. But I'm for an incremental strategy. Uh, I realize that we cannot eliminate abortion all at once, but let's have a conversation with our fellow citizens. And if the Obama administration would like to uh, have a conversation with me, I'm more than open to it. And I know all pro-life, it's not a matter of me, I know that all pro-lifers are open uh, to that. If, if they'll begin with common ground of, of forbidding second and third term abortions, at least protecting those babies who've arrived at uh, the second term or the third term, that's a start, that's great. If they'll agree to ban sex selection abortions, which is a terrible thing, that's great. If they'll believe to, if they'll agree to ban certain particularly heinous forms of abortion, like partial birth abortion, that's great. I just like them to do anything that will give some indication that they're open to understanding the dignity and worth of the life of the child in the womb, to understanding that our dignity in human beings is inherent, that we have dignity because we're human. And we have dignity from the point at which we be become human, which is the beginning. Yeah, let's have a discussion. OK. Uh, here is your last question from the audience, Professor Kamik. You concluded by stating that the perfect should not be the enemy of the good, and that we should appreciate the good that President Obama is seeking to do. Is there not a difference between appreciating that intention of our president and supporting or condoning his actions? I think his actions have to coincide with his uh, articulated uh, statements. Uh, and I think his actions are coinciding with those statements, though again, he's not making the perfect the enemy of the good either. Um, you know, on, on my refrigerator at home, there's some very important little cutouts right this moment. There's one that's the period at the end of a sentence. And the next one is a raspberry. And the next one is a peach. And the next one is an orange. And the next one is a mango. And the next one is a melon. And I'm, I've been away for a couple days, so I'm not sure what else is I'm going to find on there. But my daughter is giving us our first grandchild in August. And the ultimate protection of human life is the inspiration of love for that child. That is our calling as a church. 
That is our calling as a people. We need to find ways to inspire that love to exist. That first cutout is the period at the end of a sentence, which is larger than the embryo. And as a consequence, it's a difficult argument because when, even when my friend Professor George talks about the inherent dignity of human life in the womb, he fails to mention that a, a good deal of embryonic stem cell research is never in the womb and will never complete itself. He talks about blood and bones and so forth. I think we first of all need to recognize, again on this issue of science, that people are not prepared to concede for us that which we conclude in terms of personhood from the inference of human life and the beginning of human life. I'm going to have to cut you off here so that we have time for your uh, final statements. So one last question for you, Professor George. Uh, short answer, please. When a child is inside of a woman, is this a metaphysical problem that there is a clash of the rights of two persons? No, not a clash of the rights of two persons. That's where people go wrong, to suppose that it's somehow in the interest or a matter of the rights of a, of a woman to do away with her child and that there's a conflict of the rights of the mother and the rights of the child. No, there's a common bond of mother and child. And here's where Mother Teresa's teaching is so beautiful. Let's love mother and child. Let's never pit the interests of a woman against the interests of the child. Let's take Mother Teresa's lesson. Let's reach out in love and care and concern for both. We can do that. But if we teach the lesson in our laws that the life of the child is worth nothing, that it can be freely taken as the solution to a problem, then we've gone down the wrong path. And it doesn't matter, Doug, whether a child is in the womb or outside the womb. That baby Jill Stanick found was outside the womb, gasping for breath. But that was one of our brothers and sisters. That was a vulnerable person, among the weakest and most vulnerable. Our duty, and President Obama's duty, was to protect that child. And those blood and, blood and bones that I referred to, yeah, people disagree about whether a child has rights. I'm making the argument on one side. But I don't know of anybody, and I don't think you disagree, that that blood that is shed is human blood. Those bones that are broken are human bones. And when we take that on board, then we need to begin thinking about whether we really want to divide the world into two classes of human beings, those we regard as persons with rights and those we regard as non-persons who can be treated as instruments or property or disposable research material. We've been down the road before of declaring some classes of human beings <laughs> to be human beings but not persons. Let's not Thank go you, there again. Professor George, Thank you. now. Uh, Professor Kmick and Professor George, you each have four minutes to make a summation, and uh, I'll be telling you when your four <laughs> minutes are up. Professor Kmick. I think there's no question among people of good faith that a child in the womb is a human person worthy of dignity. I think we have to recognize that there are people not of our faith who understand the embryo that doesn't have blood, that doesn't have bones, that is in fact not going to develop blood and bones unless it is implanted in the womb, who see that embryo as in fact a gift for uh, science. I'm not saying that, again, be careful here, I'm not saying this is my position, but I'm saying we should understand how that position is stated. And the fact of the matter is, is that when you make your rhetorical argument, Professor George, and you use womb, and you use blood, and you use bones, you are always doing a late-term pregnancy. And I agree with you. We should work and have worked in the Congress of the United States to prohibit partial birth abortion, which, of course, is a, the law of the land. I agree with you that our church ought to be the leader of working toward greater legal protection. I, but the fa and, 
and when Professor, and when Professor, when Professor Obama, now President <laughs> Obama, tells us that at some point he will see his perspective as irreconcilable with his, that doesn't mean the effort at common ground and protecting of human life stops at that point. It means that different people come on the wagon. And we strike different alliances at that point with folks who indeed will be working toward a human life amendment, who will be working to overturn Roe in a way that recognizes human life and that inherent dignity. The head of the Bioethics Commission in Italy most recently said, it doesn't matter to him whether it's a matter of choice, whether it stays a matter of choice or not. He wants to at least move toward may, having the law make the anthropological point that you do agree, that we both agree on, and that life is inherently worth protecting from the first moment of conception. Professor George, you have four minutes. Uh, Doug, I think it's wrong to dismiss my argument as a rhetorical argument. If we're going to face any controversial subject, whether it's the death penalty or war or abortion and embryo destructive research, we have to face the facts. The shedding of blood and the breaking of bones in surgical abortions are facts. And we need to look at those facts straight on. We cannot avert our gaze from them. And it's not just late-term abortions in which blood is shed. Even earlier surgical abortions involve the shedding of blood. As far as embryos are concerned, the question is not what will become of them, whether we're going to implant them or not. The question is, what are they now? And to that question, there is an answer. We don't need to look it up in the Bible. We don't need to rely on the authority of any church, your church or our church. We can look up any book of human embryology and developmental biology written in the modern period and find there that from the embryonic stage forward, we have already, and not merely potentially, a whole living member of the species, Homo sapiens, who really will, if provided with a suitable environment and adequate nutrition, that will ordinarily be the maternal womb, it may be an artificial womb in short order, but who will, by directing his own integral organic functioning, I say his or her because sex is determined from the beginning, develop himself or herself to the next stages toward maturity. That human being has his development determined not by some extrinsic cause, including any signaling from the mother, may signal receptivity, but by internal direction. And that's why we might as well admit up front that what we've got here is a human being in the earliest stages of development. The human being that is now you or Professor Glendon or me is the same human being who at an earlier stage was an adolescent and before that a child and before that an infant and before that a fetus and before that an embryo. That was us. To have taken our life at any of those stages would have been to take the life of you or me. So I do think we need to face the facts and realize that our dispute with those on the other side, including President Obama, is not about the facts of science. That's clear enough. It's a question of the principles of justice. Barack Obama, in good faith I have no doubt, does not believe that all human beings are equal in worth and dignity. He believes that those at the earliest stages do not yet possess attributes that would qualify them as bearers of rights and people entitled to the protection of laws. You and I believe, and it's the core of our belief, not just a matter of religious faith, but a matter of natural law, a matter of basic justice, that every member of the human family really does possess profound, inherent, and equal dignity. Thank you, Professor George. I think it's a good time here to recall what the late John Courtney Murray said, and our late Richard Newhouse was fond of quoting, that it's a genuine achievement to reach real disagreement because so much of what passes for disagreement is just confusion. <laughs> and I think we owe a, really a great debt to both of our speakers tonight for achieving real disagreement and for doing so in a model of civil conversation about very difficult and contentious issues and pr for bringing clarity to a discussion that will continue in this country and among pro-life Catholics for a long time to come. So thank you both very much.